after testing the MGP block detector in video number 86, it is time to use it to make an occupancy indicator panel along with a simple automated block signaling system, either standalone or connected to Loconet or JMRI. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. In video number 61, I built an automated block signaling system using the BDL-168 and a blue hat. That was working nicely, but it needed Loconet to communicate block occupancy statuses to set the signals accordingly. In this video, I am using the yellow hat to make it independent of a particular brand of digital command control system. In fact, it can work as a standalone ABS. Here is what I want to do. Use an MGP block detector 8 diode to measure the six blocks on the test track. Use a simple 8x8 LED matrix to visualize the layout status, including block occupancy and signal aspects. Drive 12 block signals along the track and be able to optionally connect the system to Loconet or JMRI for further visualization or automation. First, I connect the six block feeders to outputs 1 through 6 of the MGP block detector 8 diode. Output 7 remains unused and output 8 is connected to the level switch that I could later use to change the track direction when running the block signals in APB mode as demonstrated in video number 61. Then I connect the block detector to input port A of the yellow hat. In the IoTT stick setup, I set the first 8 inputs to generate block detector messages from 101 to 108. After save and restart, I can let the locomotive run around the track and I can see the occupancy status changing on screen. But wait, it looks like there is a problem. The indicators are sometimes bouncing as the locomotive makes the transition between two blocks. This is not a problem for just driving an LED, but for layout automation it is, because it would trigger the same event multiple times. So I added a debouncing algorithm to the sensor inputs to filter out the flickering. Now the inputs only indicate a status change after 500 milliseconds of a stable signal. Much better. And if you want to make use of this and some other improvements, you should upgrade the software in your IoT stick to version 154 from the GitHub page. Next, I want to make the occupancy statuses visible on the LED matrix. Here is the track plan with the location of the blocks and the associated block detector numbers. And here is how I want to visualize this on the LED matrix. Two rows with three blocks in each row visualized with two LEDs per block. To set this up, I open the LED chain tab and add six entries, each driving two LEDs per occupancy detector address. When occupied, the LED should show red, and when the block is free, it should be yellow. I set up the first pair of LEDs and then create five copies and only change the LED numbers and block detector addresses and that's it. Save and restart and we are ready for a test run. Well, it seems to work, but only for about half of the LEDs. The reason is that I have set the total chain length to just 16 LEDs, so I change that in the LED chain setup and go to 80. That gives me room to add the 12 block signals to the end of the chain. Save and restart again and after rebooting, all the block occupancy LEDs on the matrix panel are working as the locomotive goes around the track. Now for the signals. Here I first have to make a design decision and choose one of two options. Option 1 would be implementing the signals as LEDs just based on block detector messages. And option 2 would be to use an event handler to interpret the block detector messages and send out signal messages and then have the signal mast LEDs reacting to signal aspect messages. The advantage of option number 1 is that it runs entirely on block detector messages 
which keeps the number of messages low. The problem, however, is that it provides no flexibility. Option 2, on the other hand, generates more messages. The block detector message triggers typically four signal messages to set the signals of the two adjacent blocks on each side. So it is about five times more message traffic. But it makes it very easy to replace the LED based signals by servo driven semaphores using a green hat. And it allows for changing the signal aspects from other devices or applications in the network, for example from a computer running JMRI. With all this in mind, I think it is obvious what solution is more beneficial. So the next step is to configure the event handler. To activate the event handler, I simply click the event handler checkbox in the node configuration screen. After saving, the web app displays the event handler tab and I can click it to open the configuration page. As always in an ABS system, the aspect of the signal right in front of a block is determined by the occupancy status of the block it protects and the occupancy status of the block that comes next in the travel direction of the signal. If you are not familiar with that concept, please watch videos number 20 and 21 for a detailed explanation and video number 61 for an example implementation. So, I create one event handler for every block entrance signal handling the combined events from the two block detectors of the block to be protected as well as the succeeding block. Going counterclockwise, the aspect of signal 901 is defined by the statuses of block detectors 102 and 103. Signal 903 is determined by block detectors 103 and 104, and so on. For each signal, I create an event handler that listens the two block detectors that determine the signal aspect. And for each of the four resulting combinations, I enter the aspect value that is sent to the mast. If the protected block is occupied, the aspect is zero, meaning stop. If both blocks are free, the aspect is 10, which I use for track speed. And if the protected block is free, but the adjacent block is occupied, the aspect is 3, which I use for slow. This setup is then repeated for all 12 signals, but of course I can make use of the copy function and only have to adjust block detector and signal addresses. Note that the event handler does not care how the aspect is actually displayed on a particular signal mast. It only sends the aspect and it is the task of the mast, either an LED or a servo, to convert this information into a particular color scheme or semaphore position. The final step is setting up the signals, but of course, to make things a little more interesting, I am not happy with just having signal masts along the track. I also want to have the signals displayed on my block indicator panel. On the test track, all the signals are placed on the left side of the rail when looking in travel direction. On the indicator panel, I want the signal LED at the beginning of each block and to the left as well. Now, this comes with a small problem because of the used LEDs. The 8x8 LED panel is made using LEDs with GRB color scheme. So, the same setting I use for the entire chain. But the WS2812 chips I use for the signals are of type RGB, which means red and green are reversed on the signals compared to the indicator panel. Furthermore, for signal masts 910 and 912, I am using commercial signals with a physical yellow LED, which is connected to the blue output pin of the driver chip. Sounds somewhat complicated, but it is actually possible to set this up in the LED chain setup. First, I enter the two LED numbers that need to listen to the same signal address. For signal 901, this is LED 18 on the matrix and LED 68, which is the signal mast. Next, I select DCC signal as command type and enter 901 as the signal address. Since I entered more than one LED number, I get the individual color checkbox, 
which I click so that I can select the LED colors for each LED and aspect individually. Now I set the desired colors for each aspect. For LED 18 I set aspect 0 to red, aspect 3 to yellow and aspect 10 to green, since this LED is using the GRB color scheme. Then I select LED 68 from the drop-down box and for this RGB LED I set aspect 0 to green and aspect 10 to red, knowing that choosing green will result in a red LED and vice versa. Yellow is created by mixing red and green, so there is no need to change this unless you want to use a different yellow mix to make it look better. Then the special case of the commercial signals 910 and 912. I sorted the wires for the green and red LED so that the signals use the G or B color scheme, so aspects 0 and 10 are working like all the LEDs on the matrix. Instead of yellow for aspect 3, however, I choose blue, knowing that the blue output will drive the yellow LED. And that's it. I again click save and restart, and the setup of the ABS signaling system is complete. Finally, and just to make it look a little more realistic, I used PowerPoint to design the track layout with block LEDs and signals and printed it on a piece of paper that I can simply place on top of the LED matrix. Looks almost like a small CTC panel, similar to the picture frame CTC panel from video number 9. So it's time for a test drive. If there is no locomotive on track, all block indicators show yellow and all signals are set to green. When I place the locomotive on track, the block it sits on changes to occupied and the signals leading into the block turn to red. And the signals leading into the adjacent blocks change to yellow, indicating slow. Now, as the locomotive moves around the track, the protected block moves with the locomotive, always turning the two signals leading into the block to red and the signals leading into the neighboring blocks to yellow. Typical 3 aspect ABS system. If you watch closely on the block indicator panel, you can also see the algorithm at work. When the locomotive enters the block, we first see the block LEDs turning red. Then, after the event handler triggered the signal commands based on the block detector information, we see the signals changing to the required aspect. The same happens when the locomotive is leaving. First, the block becomes free, then the signals change to a higher aspect, either slow or track speed. Just like the real thing. And if you like this, please let me know. Now that the system is working, let's have a look at some technical aspects of setting this up using the IoT stick and a yellow hat. The first is data backup. Like always when working with computers, it is a good idea to make safety backups of the configuration data. You can do that by writing the stick data to a disk file on your computer that can be reloaded if data on the stick should be lost. To do that, you can click the Save to File button that is on each configuration page. It transfers the data that is stored on the stick to a disk file and lets you choose a name for it. There are two things to keep in mind though. First, it only saves data that is stored on the stick. So if you make changes using the configuration page, you first need to click Save and Restart to write the data to the stick. When you then click Save to File, your changes are stored on the stick and will make it to the disk file. And second, each disk file that you create will only have the data of the configuration page you call the save to file function from. So if you click save to file while you are on the event handler configuration page, you will save the event handler data only. To save the LED data, you would have to call the save to file function on the LED chain page. The only exception to this rule is the node configuration page. If you click save to file there, the entire configuration data will be saved to the file. And if you want to save the node configuration data only, 
You can hold down the control key when clicking save to file and only the data of the node configuration will be sent to the disk file. To load the data back you click load from file on the node configuration page. Select the file you want to load and the stick will replace the currently stored data by the data in the file. During this process it will check what data the file you load contains and replace only that data. So if you load the file with the event handler data, it will replace the event handler data but leave everything else unchanged. So with that functionality in mind, would it not be extremely convenient if you could try the example demonstrated in this video without going through the hassle of setting it up yourself? Glad you asked. I just added a new directory called config data on my github page where I am going to publish data files that can be loaded to the IoT stick. The example configuration used in this video is the first file in that library. In the coming weeks I will add more data files, some more examples and test configurations as well as some recovery files that can be used in case a configuration is completely lost. The second technical aspect I want to briefly discuss is the communication mode. You may wonder, how does this example work if the IoT stick is not even connected to a digital command control system? Well, let's have a quick look into the command source settings. As you see, it is set to Loconet loopback. In this mode, the stick is using Loconet commands, for example for block detector messages, but they are not going to a physical loconet. They are just looped back and then used for triggering the event handler. So it is loconet but only some sort of a virtual network. If you now want to connect the ABS system to a real network, you simply change the communication mode. Connect a loconet interface to the growth port of the stick and make it work as loconet device or select Loconet over MQTT and make it work with an MQTT broker and a gateway. Or select Loconet LB server client and connect it to a Loconet LB server and see the data for example in JMRI and so on. So as always with the stick, all communication options are available, but if you really want, you can also make it a standalone solution. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you now have a better understanding how to use block detectors and the yellow hat to create a working ABS system for your model railroad layout. In one of the future videos I will show how to use block detectors and event handlers to configure more complex signaling systems including some CTC functionality. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you will have a premium seat when that video comes out. Thanks for watching and see you on the next video.